Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, they just saw the movie. Uh, actually, it came out uh, several months ago, right at the, just as the pandemic was about to shut everything down, this movie uh, was <laughs> in theaters. So uh, it was, it actually came out like a week before the, the whole kind of lockdown thing happened. So I thought, oh my gosh, this is like the worst possible luck because I was so um, proud of the movie and wanted people to see it. And then um, they kind of moved it into streaming very quickly. And, and you, there was this whole captive audience, uh, you know, sitting at home who got, you know, so it sort of turned out well because more, uh, probably more people saw it, you know, that way than would have yeah. otherwise. And, uh, I think so. I think uh, I think a lot of people saw it during this time in these months, and uh, and now again too. We were in what we call, which you know well, award season. So there's a lot of screenings going on and a, a lot of renewed attention. And I, you know, I have to ask you about this movie too because you've been doing both behind the camera and in front of the camera a lot of big movies, a lot of different kinds of things. This is much more, you know, a smaller, more intimate, character driven kind of uh, movie at this point. Why did you want to uh, do this at this time? You know, I mean, this is really the kind of movie that um, is interesting to me, honestly. You know, I found that more and more, and it's sort of returning to like, you know, this always been my sort of core interest is dramas, you know, like starting with Google Hunting. And, you know, dramas about people who, I mean, well, that character wasn't exactly sort of ordinary, but real people in real life, and that's just what I identify with. It's what I think is more interesting, you know, finding meaning and resonance and, and empathizing with people whose lives aren't, you know, elevated in any way, but like really trying to evoke that meaning and create empathy. And that's the only thing that I really love doing day to day. And this movie in particular kind of really reconnected me with what I love about acting purely. And um, I feel like I've uh, kind of, learned more about acting as I've gotten older and gotten more interested in sort of nuance and detail and gotten more comfortable with sort of accessing, you know, the full range of, I guess, my emotions or whatever it is. You know, I just felt really comfortable doing this, even though every day, you know, a lot of the scenes were quite painful and difficult and stuff, you know, it was, it was a very cathartic experience. And this is really kind of what I want to spend the rest of my career doing is movies uh, more or less like this, you know, that are about people and what happens to them and the challenges they face and how they overcome them or don't. And, and uh, movies that hopefully can kind of inspire people, but also don't uh, cheat the audience by suggesting that there's easy way outs or easy, you know, victories um, that are kind of honest with the audience as well. That's what I was just going to ask you too. You know, this is a movie about redemption in many ways, but not easy redemption. And it doesn't offer a lot of easy answers or cliches. I mean, you're dealing with a, a movie about addiction, a movie about sports. We've seen those genres done endlessly in movies, but this one feels a little bit different in that regard too. And also, you know, people know your own personal story too, that you're bringing to this in whatever way as an actor as well. Yeah, yeah, there's that, which I kind of wish, you know, I feel like people know so much about actors' lives that it makes it harder and harder to kind of suspend disbelief and believe that there's somebody else because you just saw what they had lunch, you know, what they had for lunch on Instagram. And so it's, I feel like that stuff kind of just makes your job harder in some ways. Um, but yes, this is a story about, it's, it's about redemption. It's ultimately about kind of for me, because really, although it's revealed sort of, partway through the movie, it's about loss and suffering and how you overcome that. And the most profound, I think, loss of all is the loss of a child. And that's what I think, you know, cycles him into this addiction. It, it, it ends his marriage. It, it puts him in a place where he's, this character, Jack Cunningham, is completely disengaged uh, from the world and has kind of given up. And it's about how do you reconnect with life? How do you find meaning in your own life? How do you get up in the morning, um, even though things are hard and not don't always turn out the way you want. I didn't want to do something that just, you know, made it easy or simple, or that said that like, once you, you know, uh, make this choice to, you know, to get better and recover or, or to try to move forward past whatever trauma you've experienced, that it's all easy and simple. Um, but it was, you know, and yes, being a, like a, people know that I'm a, a recovering alcoholic. And so they kind of, um, I imagine sort of think, oh, well, this must have some 
similarity with his own life, although like addiction, compulsive behavior, those kinds of, I mean, such a broad spectrum. And when you kind of expand it to include all the various ways that can manifest itself from like, you know, food to shopping to sex, the internet to game. I mean, it's, you know, compulsive behavior is actually quite pervasive in society. And so I thought that was something that, you know, actually a lot of people could, could probably identify with. And um, this character story is very different from my own. And thank God I haven't suffered the the loss that this character did, which is the, the most relevant thing about his um, biography, really. But, uh, you know, those those stories about people facing real challenges in their lives, hopefully challenges that people in the audience can on some level identify with, I think are the most or can be the most resonant and interesting. It's definitely not a movie you go to to just escape and, you know, wander off into like a fantasy and sort of forget your life for a couple hours. Hopefully it's something that people can kind of project their own experiences on and, you know, draw some sense of uh, hope from, because ultimately it is a movie about, you know, triumphing over the things that are difficult in our life, you know, um, and I think that's interesting. And I think if it's told in an honest way, it can be, there's a real value to that as well. You know, it reminded me in some ways, I, like I was watching, you know, I've been watching a lot of classic films uh, during this period. I really like reconnected with that uh, and uh, watch a couple with Paul Newman, uh, The Verdict and The Hustler. And this movie, oddly enough, reminds me of that and your performance, too, because he's down at a certain point in his life and, and trying to bring it back up. And there is that. And Hollywood used to make these movies all the time. And, you know, when you, from major studios, and you just don't see it that much. This was unique in, in that way. Yeah. I mean, the Verdict, you know, is a movie that, like, that was the poster I had up in the production office when we were doing Gone Baby Gone. I mean, it's a movie that's influenced me for a long, long time. I think it's magnificent. And you have this really broken, flawed protagonist who is an alcoholic, and he's at a funeral home trying to hustle clients at the beginning of the movie. I mean, it, it breaks a lot of the contemporary... Um, conventional wisdom rules about, you know, likability yeah. and that kind of thing, you know, it's really brave and, and it's um, incredibly moving. Yeah. And, and can you imagine, no, I don't think any studio would make that movie. I think you'd have a hard time even selling that to some of the braver streaming services because, um, you know, it's sort of migrated into a world where, where there's this sense that like we have to really, uh, you know, be able to like 100% and identify with and accept all the behavior of our protagonist. Otherwise, we're somehow either tacitly endorsing that behavior or glamorizing it, or, you know, there's definitely a reluctance to to take risks in that way um, with, with characters. And that's why I was so thrilled that, you know, they want to make the movie. And yeah, we had to make it for a price. And of course, I understood that. It's not a, you, should, you shouldn't, you know, spend the bank on a movie like this because there's probably a select audience that are interested in this kind of movie. But that being said, I was really pleased that they made it and pleased that they, you know, were able to um, make a little bit of money. And I, that's great. I mean, that was really what I was hoping for was that I could do this and show that there was an audience for it so that, you know, I'd get the chance to do it again, frankly, which is what actors yeah, another most upset. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Uh, another aspect of it is the basketball and being believable that you were a star player at one time and now a coach and 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 somebody who's very versed in basketball and but coming back on that. So how did you develop that? You were not into basketball growing up or anything, I don't think, right? No, I mean, I played with my friend, but I didn't play like organized basketball. I wasn't on the high school team. Uh, and I didn't do a ton of organized sports, really. So that was something that, like, you know, predictably, I was like in the theater and doing the plays. And that was, I was one of those <laughs> kids. And um, yeah, that was the thing I was most insecure about and did the most research on. And because there is a certain sort of physicality and carriage and way that kind of um, uh, people who have been professional athletes sort of physically come across. And then there's also a degree of comfort in terms of like, you know, coaches seem very confident and present and they're so used to doing it. And I wanted to try to, so I spent a lot of time looking at footage and video and talking to coaches and going to games. And, um, but ultimately kind of what it came down to was I realized like, uh, it was about feeling comfortable as a leader for the players. And so I, uh, I, 
I like, I realized that it was going to be about, for me, trying to win the sort of genuine respect of the actors who were playing those parts and trying to uh, develop a relationship with them in real life would kind of parallel that experience. And luckily for me, they were just great guys and great actors and they made the experience so much fun and so rewarding. And that, that became for me the process of, you know, feeling comfortable as a coach, just feeling comfortable with these, these young guys. Yeah, and then story-wise, they're giving more back to you than, than maybe you're even giving to them as a coach. That seems to be it. I'm sh That's definitely the case in the movie. I mean, he gets a lot more from them, for sure, than they get from him. And that was also the case for me. You know, I mean, uh, you know, they were curious about stuff and had questions for me about acting on auditions and casting directors and agents and, you know, all this stuff. And it reminded me so much of being in this movie I did in 1991 or something called School Ties, where I was just yeah. one of the guys, football team, and we were all young actors trying to audition and you know wanting to work and and kind of eager and excited just to get a chance to do it, just to be actors, just to be in a movie was so thrilling, and it really connected me with the just pure joy and my own good fortune in being able to do this for a living for you know now you know a number of years and and it was it was wonderful you know they, they and, and so i got really into like listening to their stories and they put me on their group text chat you know what i mean i felt very uh, very in with the kids you know what I mean? yeah <laughs> this sort of give, gives you the feeling of sports as a metaphor for life too and you're working with a director again uh who did the accountant with you uh, gavin o'connor is a wonderful director who's done uh, genre, uh, you know, in the genre in very different ways, Warrior and Miracle and, and movies in the sports world. Uh, how was that relationship and, and why was he the right director, do you think, for this? You know, I knew, yeah, obviously I had a relationship with Gavin and one of the things that I knew about him was even though the accountant was in the sort of action genre, he was always very drawn to like what was interesting about the character, it, uh, in that case, this guy who was on the spectrum and, and trying to find realistic ways um, to, to convey that as much as he was in the fights and all that stuff. And um, to me, that was the most interesting aspect of that. And, you know, he had done an, an excellent job, as you mentioned, with movies that had sports in them. And it is really critical, especially now the degree of familiarity we have with, you know, on super high resolution HDTV, you know, we know what sports looks like. We recognize it, you know, the sports movies that were made when I was a kid would not pass muster now. They would immediately feel inauthentic because you're like, this guy's not a third baseman in Major League Baseball or whatever. And, and so he, I knew that he would shoot that stuff in a really convincing way and also not at the expense of, of the character drama. And, you know, more than that, I knew that he was, that was really where, what he was drawn to and what he was interested in. And it was really actually, I felt like sometimes I had to draw him back into the sports side of it and be like, remember this part of the story, because that's important too. Because he was so like, yeah, yeah, the sports thing, but this is really about the guy, you know. Um, but it's, it's great to work with somebody that you have a, a comfort and a trust and a rapport with and versus showing up and you really haven't, you know, have, you know, you, it can take you half the movie if you ever get there to develop a real trust with the woman or man directing the movie. And you, you, you know, that's a, it's a risky thing. It's a hard, you're making yourself vulnerable. You're really putting yourself out there. And when you take a big, to use a sports metaphor, a big swing in a performance, uh, you know, you risk, you can risk looking really bad if the director doesn't have the taste and, and sense of like, you know, like I for, for what you're doing, you know, and, and also isn't willing to take those risks with you. And I had a level of comfort with Gab and that made that a lot easier. Yeah, I'm curious too. You mentioned the director and things. Obviously you're a director yourself. You've been directing as much as you've been acting, maybe even more in recent years or a combination thereof. Do you walk on a set like this? What's your thing as a director in your, but not on this project? And uh, how does that help you? Uh, you know, deliver for him as, as the star of the film? Well, you know, directing taught me a lot about acting, really. I mean, directing taught me that um, you really have to understand and kind of align yourself with what the director's interested in and their vision and that trying to sort of pull your own, chart your own course performance-wise um, you know, doesn't really make sense. You sort of want to make sure you're on the same page with the director because the director's going to go in their direction once they get in the editing room. 
And, and so, you know, it's wiser to be heading that way and experimenting that way. It doesn't mean like just sort of take line readings, but it does mean like really be on the same page with the movie the director's making rather than trying to impose your own movie on that. And if anything, it gave me a stronger sense of respect for the director, that it's the director's medium and that, you know, you want, you have to, um, you know, try to fulfill the director's vision of that character. And in terms of my own acting, I think, it, you know, looking at my own performance and other actors' performances and cutting them together editorially and seeing what sorts of things tended to work and what didn't and, and getting myself accustomed to like forcing myself to look at my own performance, which is, it's like, you know, it's, a, you know, some people don't even want to hear their own voice on their voicemail outgoing message, you know, it, it makes, can make you uncomfortable and you have to kind of get past that. And it's another way of, sort of getting over these hurdles that make you self-conscious that are impediments to, you know, naturally communicating genuine emotional uh, experiences on, on camera, you know? Uh, so I would say, I, I think I became a much, I think, uh, you know, I, I learned more from about acting from directing than just about anything else. The exception of my acting teacher in high school was really brilliant is a brilliant guy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, I have some questions from uh, the audience, but I did want to ask you before I get to that, I loved Al Madrigal in this. He played Dan, uh, your <laughs> assistant, and I love the, uh, the stuff between you two and, and, and the way that worked out. He was terrific. The whole cast was great. He, he was wonderful. Yeah, the whole cast was great. You know, Michaela, Janina. I mean, there was really, all, everyone was just wonderful to work with. Jeremy the, and the, the guys, playing the players, you know, like Melvin's incredible. And it was, um, but yeah, yeah, you know, uh, you know, his, he was so funny and such an interesting guy and, and so much fun to be around. There's something to, I found the sort of, I don't, I'm not a believer that you need to suffer to make something good. I'm actually a believer in, in the notion that the more at ease you are, the more relaxed you are. The, the better you'll be. There's a sort of paradox, like the easier it feels, the better it is. When it feels hard and painful and awful, it's usually because there's something wrong and something's not working. And being around people who are good actors and good people, you know, is, is like just the wonderful luxury. It makes it so much easier to do your job and so much easier to not worry and to make yourself, like allow yourself to look foolish or stupid or take risks and not feel like people are gonna be judging you or criticizing you or going home and be like, man, I was terrible today, you know? <laughs> well, we have some questions here. Janine Gius, Giusto, uh, what what parameters uh, must a project meet for you to want to sign on? How has that changed over the course of your career? I, I would say it's changed a lot, uh, even in the last five years. You know, like for me now at this stage in my career, um, I really want to work on um, both as a director and as an actor. And, you know, like it's got to hold my interest and be about something that I think is really interesting and kind of significant, at least to me, you know, because the worst thing that can happen to you is uh, that you get bored by what you're working on or that you develop like a kind of a contempt or a disdain or at least a sort of indifference to the material. You just won't be as good. It won't be as good, you know, and, and so, it's got to be resonant and meaningful to me. I don't have any parameters in terms of like, you know, there's got to be a kid and it's a mountain picture or like, a, you know, it's got to have a champ. It's just like, it's just <laughs> about how it hits me. And if it seems meaningful and real and, and I have it and have an opportunity to, um, you know, play flawed, interesting characters. I think that's a, the most rewarding thing you can do as an actor. Now, um, Aaron Medeiros, uh, well, he has like a three-part question. Let me see. You're, you're one of Hollywood's and one of my favorite actors and directors. All four of the films you've directed are masterful, and I've been anxiously waiting for your next film. Are you working on looking to direct anything? What makes you say, I need to direct this? Is anything coming up that you're looking to direct? Yeah, I'm, I'm working. I'm about to start um, in the process of beginning writing this project that I'd like to direct next year for Paramount based on a book called The Long Goodbye, which is about, uh, sort of revolves around the making of Chinatown. And, um, oh, you know, yeah. it's, it's a really interesting story. It's kind of emblematic of sort of the whole shift in the industry that happened, you know, from the seventies into the eighties. And, um, 
the sort of big companies buying uh, studios and you know the risks that people took and the, the, it's really interesting because I'm interested in the creative process. There's a lot of brilliant people who were sort of in conflict with one another in some ways and in, and in collaboration with one another and others. And that's movie that is now taught, you know, for example, like, you know, in film schools, I was like, this is the, you know, perfect screen yeah. like Chinatown. You know? um, <laughs> it emerged from a lot of people's contributions. I mean, obviously Robert Town's central vision, but the final movie, as it often is, contributed to in different ways by all the different principal people involved. And uh, anyway, it's very, it's interesting. And uh, Lauren Michaels is producing it. And um, I'm going to try to, um, you know, start writing that and hopefully direct it uh, next year. And so, you know, but it could be that it ends up the script isn't good and I end up doing something else or who knows, <laughs> but that's the plan. That sounds great, actually. Um, is there any film that was overlooked in your career that you love and wished to uh, perform better? Okay, saying, is there any movie that you made that personally you Maybe. You know, I've kind of come to a place, I was talking to Matt actually about this the other day, Matt Damon, who, um, you know, lives down the street and I, and we still get the chance to see each other pretty regularly, which is really nice. And we just did this movie together um, that Ridley Scott directed that he and Nicole Hall Center and I wrote. And um, so we've been spending a lot of time together and we were talking about the degree to which, you know, we've kind of evolved from uh being focused on like what's the external reaction to something we do and a shift toward our own standards like is did this meet my standards was it rewarding for me did i think it was interesting do i think it was valuable uh, for me did i learn something that i think it was good rather than worrying about well it has to do this much money at the box office or people have to say this or that about it you know um because really that's the only standard that you can kind of honestly hold yourself to you don't you never really know how people are going to respond or whether it's going to resonate or whether, you know, all those things are kind of mysterious in a way. I've worked on movies that thought were great, that were received well and vice versa. Um, yeah, one movie that comes to mind that I really loved was actually um, a movie that Mike Judge directed called Extract. It was this character that I always wanted to play. It was very weird. It had this long wig and a beard and it was a comedy <laughs> and uh, Jason Bateman was in it, Kristen Wiig, and I had so much fun and... Uh, that's one of my favorite performances. That's, uh, I mean, the guy is a very out there guy, but it was definitely um, a lot of fun. And I, I wish, uh, you know, I wish that had been a giant global blockbuster, but. Uh, <laughs> People should yeah, check I'll it out. I remember it well. It was a great movie, actually. It was really funny. Um, if you could remake any movie as an actor or director, which film would it be? You know, remakes are really hard because, like, um, you know, there are a couple of movies that I thought about remaking and looked into the rights of, and then watched the movies and watched them again, and then thought like, hmm, this movie actually, like you wouldn't want, this is this is, movie is excellent, and I'm not sure that it can be improved upon or updated any way other than just you making a pale imitation of the original. <laughs> movies that are, are suitable for like, I think remakes in some ways are like, I've been developing Witness for the prose Prosecution, which is like yeah. a movie who's, that would now feel kind of dated just because of technology and uh, the way the world has changed, but whose underlying premise is still really relevant. And, um, and that feels like something that, um, you know, I'm hoping, uh, you know, could be an interesting uh, remake, but that, that's a tricky thing because you don't want to go like, you know, no, no one's going to remake uh, Citizen Kane or The Godfather. You know, your favorite movies you don't want to remake. You just want to watch, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah. Remake's the tricky thing. It's like, is it, was it like just, you know, right for then? And can it be changed substantially for now and made more resonant and different? Because there's no point in just making the same movie over again, you know. Yeah. Uh, this is clearly coming from one of our SAG members here. How do you prepare for your emotional scenes? Great work in your movie, The Way Back. I see an Oscar coming your way. That's from Louie. <laughs> um, you know, preparation is like different for different roles, but in terms of emotions, I've found as I've had more experience in life and been through more things and, you know, kind of come to grips with more about it and talked about it and the more therapy and, you know, gone through the various things that you that you go through as you get older, I've 
come to understand. First of all, I have more experiences than I can access. You know, when I was young, I, I, you know, when I was 20 years old, I hadn't lived very much, you know what I mean? And, and focused on stuff that I, I kind of knew. And now with a broader set of experiences and a, I think a better perspective on them is I've spent time thinking about my own life and my own psychology and, 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 um, you know, I, you just have naturally sort of more to bring in terms of like feelings to access. And what I find is that when a movie works for me, I sort of naturally and subconsciously identify with the emotional reality. And sometimes there's things to which I affix uh, like a psychological, emotional relevance from my own life. Like, okay, this character is this person or this event is that event and try to remember what those feelings are like, which is, you know, like Stanislavski and a lot of acting school teach. And then there's, um, and then there's the sort of the other kind of, of research, which I don't think Louis is asking about, which has to do with like the basketball stuff or, you know, trying, you know, or like with the town, like, you know, bank robbers or FBI agents or, you know, where you really want to, um, you know, not, you know, feel authentic to the, to the audience and you need to research something that you don't have any experience with. And that just has to do with exposing yourself, educating yourself, spending a lot of time around those folks, you know, Triple Frontier, we spent a lot of time with special forces operators and learn from them. And, but the emotional stuff kind of comes from, I've, I've found, I mean, there are young actors who are able to do like miraculous things. I don't think I became the actor that I really wanted to be until I got a bit older and had more life experience and had more to draw from. And um, maybe I'm just not that good at using my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that ties right in with one from Aida Munoz here, who's uh, asking how you approach creating your character's backstory. Do you sit down and write it or, you know, because uh, a lot of that's not going to be in the script. I definitely uh, have to know what it is. I used to write it. I, sometimes I would do these, you know, Bibles. Sometimes I would take notes. Uh, sometimes, and um, what I've started doing is making sure that the director and I um, always, you know, agreed on what the backstory was, so that if stuff would come up in a scene, we could talk about, well, this is relevant to that event or this that other event that happened in the character's past. And a lot of that stuff, you know, you kind of die with your secrets. Like, yeah, it doesn't end up the script, the audience never knows, but it does kind of inform your performance and give it a kind of three dimensionality. And you are thinking about something and you come as close as you can really to being a real person with a real history and a real uh, life. And, you know, I've come to believe more and more that so much of what we experience and so much of uh, how we feel really has to do, you know, 80% of it is our past, our subconscious, our experiences. And, you know, and then a lot of it is our subjective, you know, our needs, our wants, the, the vantage point from which we see things. And then a very, very small amount of it has to do with what's actually happening. Um, and so it, I think really, really important to have a backstory for a character to really understand what that is um, and, and kind of internalize that in a way that's almost more important than making choices about, well, I'm gonna play the scene this way or that way. I'm more comfortable knowing who, who the character is and then seeing kind of what happens in the scene rather than, you know, in this line, I'm gonna go up and then, you know, scoring the script and, and approaching it sort of outside in, you know, um, this is sort of classic debate between whether or not you create a, you know, there's two schools of thought, right? Which is the sort of Brando method, you know, you generate authentic emotion and then that's resonant to an audience. And there's a sort of Olivier, you know, school, I mean, at least when I was taught acting, you know, that represented sort of, if you recreate, you know, accurately the, and, and you know, stress the muscles in the face that are stressed when you feel sadness, that will in fact tell the brain that you're feeling sad and create sadness as sort of outside in performance. Um, I've never been as comfortable with that version of it. I've always found that I've had to like really genuinely be feeling something otherwise it just wasn't, it just didn't feel as good, you know, um, planning out inflections and pauses. And, you know, although like working with a director like Kevin Smith, he's very much like, because he's so uh, script oriented, you know, he does want it to be like, -da 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 you know what I mean? And, and you have to be able to, to do that too, because some directors feel, you know, who are writers, you know, feel, you know, imagine the text delivered in exactly one way, and that's how they want it to be done. And if you're, resisting and fighting that all the time, it, it can be very frustrating. And it's wiser, I think, to try to go, 
okay, so if that's the way you want it to sound, what does that mean in terms of what the character's feeling and to figure it out that way? Uh, you know, it sort of, sort of ties in with this question. Oli Cohen, in Goodwill Hunting, Chucky stays behind to work construction while well advances. And Jack's story in The Way Back begins on a job site. Do you see any continuation of that character to this, a possible finishing of a story arc? <laughs> okay. I was doing the um, construction site stuff and the work and on the bridge and there in San Pedro. Um, <laughs> that The last time I played a character who worked on a construction site was Google Hunting and it was a sort of full circle feeling. Um, uh, you know, but uh, in, in, they're very different movies, but they are all definitely, and I think those jobs kind of root you in a sort of fundamental, basic, you know, the idea being this person is not, you know, you're, this isn't like, you know, the typical introduction to an action suspense movie is that he was the best there ever was. He's the best assassin, you know, in Armageddon, we were the best oil drillers in history, you know, and we had to be sent to space. Um, you know, it's, it's actually, he's not the best, you know, he, anything. This is a guy who people can relate to. He's an ordinary guy and, and living an ordinary life. And that was also the case with the Chucky character in Goodwill Hunting, which served to contrast the sort of extraordinary aspects of uh, the Will character and what he was kind of destined for. And, um, and in the case of Goodwill Hunting, we actually shot at the construction site that Matt and I worked at for two summers in Massachusetts. I later thought like, we should have charged them. We put their sign in the movie and we promoted that <laughs> construction movie, but um, that's the, I became worse in later years. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, that, I did, that, that also came to mind and I felt like tonally in some ways the movies were uh, uh, kind of similar. All right, we have like time for one or two more. So having experience as a producer, director, writer, actor, and so forth, and having excelled at all of them, what role do you find the most rewarding? And why? You know, in the case of this movie, definitely um, there is a kind of re emotional reward that you get as an actor when you really come in contact with the feeling that, that you want to create. And even if it's a feeling of despondency or despair or, you know, it actually is quite exhilarating. To, uh, to really get there. And, you know, you can have this feeling of being in tears on the one hand and inside feeling a kind of thrilled. Um, and it is very cathartic. You know, I didn't come home from work from that movie depressed every day. I came home, you know, invigorated and feeling, you know, excited and alive. And uh, there is a particular thrill to that, to acting, which is, you know, really unique um, and very personal. And, and, uh, by the same token, there is something also very satisfying about directing because it, it's sort of the opposite of that. It's like constructing so many disparate things, you know, or, or build, you know, drawing from so many different disparate sources, trying to construct a unified whole that an audience can follow and be moved by, you know, and the feeling of, you know, uh, when it works, when you're mostly in the editing room, when you feel like you work at a scene, you work at a scene, and then you have that moment of, all of a sudden it feels real and it feels alive is also kind of, uh, thrilling, you know, um, they're different, but, but those are the two that I'm writing is a lot of frustration and blank page. And then even then it's kind of like, well, let's see how it turns out and what it ends up being and what ends up in the movie. Because a lot of time writing screenplays is like a tree falling in the woods, you know, and producing can be rewarding if you're fostering somebody that you think is talented and you want to bring to the world or help, get their, um, you know, their sort of form of artistic expression out there. Um, and so, you know, that, that is also rewarding when you feel really good about who you're working with, but it's, for me, I would say acting in foremost and, and directing secondarily, depending on, on the project, you know, but for this movie was really, really, I wouldn't have preferred to be doing anything else. And there's something great about acting too, because, you know, when there's a problem and the, you lose the permit or you're running late or whatever, you can just go back to your trailer and it's like, somebody else's problem, you know, you don't have to worry about all that. very siloed. Um, finally, Rochelle's asking, what has been the most challenging role for you to play in your career so far? <clears throat> probably this, probably the way back. Um, you know, uh, it, it was the, mo on the one hand, it felt very vulnerable because I knew that people would, 
you know, people bring a lot of, um, you know, they might bring a lot of their own issues to it and look to the movie to see if it's honest in a way that resonates with them in their own experience. And, and I had sat down and talked to people who had lost children and I really wanted to do justice to what that experience was like, you know, if you could possibly imagine, you know, which I don't know that you really can, but, um, and it, and it was just required the most raw, vulnerable, open sort of depth, you know, reaching for me as a actor and a person and a, and a kind of being willing to, you know, I, I, I gained a lot of weight. I, you know, was not a vain exercise. This is, we look like a guy who was broken down and kind of falling apart. And, you know, there's the fear of as an actor, that people are going to think this is really me or this is what I'm like, you know, having to abandon all that stuff and then really go for the emotional reality. I would say that was the most challenging experience for me today. I mean, there are other kinds of challenges, which are not as good, which is when you are challenged by something that is like, you feel like this is blood from stone, but uh, that's a, that's another story. That, that, that's for another day. Uh, <laughs> thanks, man. This has been great. Uh, and uh, really good performance in, in the way back. Thanks for sharing all this with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Nice to see you. Absolutely. You too. You too.